Okay, so to start, I want to start talking about this idea of incentives, which is a, a microeconomics tool that um, essentially explains why people do the things that they do. Um, and this is important for MPA and MPP students um, because it helps you learn how you can motivate people to um, make good choices. If you want people to pay their taxes, you have to make sure that there are incentives for doing so. If you want people to make good public health choices, um, you need to make sure that there are incentives to do so. Um, anytime you're trying to change behavior or structure a policy in a way that makes it so people do what you want, um, you need to make sure the incentives are structured in a way that makes it so they do that. Um, if the incentives are not aligned correctly, then they're not going to end up doing the thing that you want them to do. So talking about incentives is important here. Um, and the reason this matters um, kind of in a microeconomics world is, again, microeconomics deals with why individuals make the choices that they do. And so one important question here is, why do people do the things that they do? Um, why do you choose to take this class? Why do you choose, why did you choose to eat what you had for breakfast this morning? Um, you had some motivation for doing it. Um, it got you, it, it brought you some amount of happiness. And this happiness, um, what economists call it, is not happiness, they call it utility. And so one of the core principles of economics here is that you get utility from doing stuff. Um, the choices you make bring you utility. And in theory, the choices you make should bring you the maximum amount of utility. Um, your whole goal in life is to maximize utility and become the happiest possible. Um, and so you get utility from different locations, um, there's, there's different motivations for what you're doing. There are extrinsic rewards um, where you're completing this MPA or MPP degree because in theory you want to have a higher salary at the end, you want to find better jobs, and so that is a good motivating factor. Um, you want to um, kind of improve your salary in the future, and so that is motivating you to finish this degree. Um, it motivates you to eat different foods. If you really like a specific type of food, you're going to eat it because it makes you feel good and it gives you extrinsic rewards and that's great. Um, so that's from the extrinsic side. It's some sort of external reward that you get. Um, you can also have intrinsic utility, which is the, the benefit or the happiness that you get um, inside, um, or it's kind of the internal motivation for doing something. And so you might be getting an MPA or an MPP degree because you feel um, called to public service. You want to make the world a better place, and um, by getting this degree, it helps you um, do that. It positions you better to have a greater impact in the world. Um, and so that is what is motivating you um, to work on this degree. It's not to, or it is, you do have the extrinsic side, which is getting more money, but you also have the intrinsic side where you want to um, help build society more and, and improve the public. And so that is kind of the intrinsic side. You're internally motivated to do something because you feel that it is right. Um, and so these are the kind of the two broad categories of utility and why you're motivated to do things. And the reason this is important is because um, sometimes these things can cancel each other out and crowd each other out. Um, and they can get distorted. And we care about this because you can mess this up. If you try to set a policy um, that rewards people for doing something that they should be motivated to do intrinsically, but you add an extrinsic reward, you can actually crowd out the good behavior um, the, from the intrinsic side and turn it into essentially a market transaction, and that's bad. Um, and so you need to pay attention to why people do things, especially when you're setting policy. Um, and so this is a quote from your Naked Economics reading here, where essentially if you, like, you want to care about incentives because good policy uses incentives to channel behavior to some sort of outcome. Um, if you have bad policy, you're not considering um, the incentives and you're not going to consider why people do what they do. Um, and so what you want to do is think about why people do the things they do um, to make sure that kind of the policy gets implemented in the future. Some good examples of this not working um, are something specific. It's called perverse incentives. This is why you, I had you read the Dolphin article or the first three paragraphs of the Dolphin article. This is a fascinating example of perverse incentives where this dolphin here 
was really, really smart. Um, it figured out how to game the system to maximize the amount of fish that it was getting and the amount of rewards that it was getting. Um, the, the trainers taught it how to pick up trash and so it was purposely like hoarding trash and purposely bringing up just little pieces of it so that it could string along the trainers and get the most amount of food. Um, it was not motivated by intrinsic rewards. It was not motivated by having a clean pool or anything like that. It just wanted the fish. And so because of that, it rationally acted in a way that got it the most amount of fish, um, which is fascinating because it's not a human. Um, but everything does this. We all act in this way. Um, another example from your Naked Economics reading um, was um, prior to the uh, Vietnam War, where the United States got involved, the French were um, kind of the colonial, the colonial imperial powers over Vietnam. Um, and while they were in charge, they wanted to um, eliminate a giant rat infestation. And so in Hanoi, they decided to um, start paying farmers for um, rat bodies so that they could um, eliminate the rat problem. They wanted to, to get rid of all of the excess rats. And so by paying the farmers to bring in the dead rats, um, they could get rid of it quickly. Um, but what they found, according to your Naked Economics reading, was that the farmers started growing their own rats on purpose um, because they could get money for it. And so they, it made the rat problem worse because the incentives were structured in a way that made it so um, they wanted to get more financial rewards for it. And so it created a whole industry of rat growing, um, similar to the dolphin example, similar to any example where you have some sort of um, extrinsic motivation that you want people to attain, they will do what they can to attain that. Um, another good example of this is the No Child Left Behind um, law that George W. Bush passed um, early in his um, first term, where um, we talked about this a couple sessions ago. Um, they wanted to encourage schools to improve their test scores and to um, make it so that students were learning more. And so they tied that to test scores specifically. They also tied teacher performance and teacher raises to test scores um, with the hope that um, students would learn more and you could measure that through testing. Um, but what happened in the wake of No Child Left Behind is that schools started shifting their whole strategy of teaching to testing. Um, and essentially teaching to the test and doing everything that they could to make it so that students would have the highest test scores possible. Um, there was academic research that came out that showed that if you um, fed students like high calorie food in the morning, like donuts and orange juice, they could perform better on tests that were done earlier in the morning. And so schools started pumping kids full of donuts and orange juice in the morning because they wanted to kind of maximize their potential test scores. Um, and that's kind of the rational thing that, that happened. The incentives were structured in a way that made it so that you could maximize your extrinsic rewards or extrinsic utility by doing all sorts of weird shenanigans to, to have that happen, um, which is probably not what the policymakers intended, um, but it's what ended up happening. So these incentives are important because people will always respond to what you signal. If you say test scores are important, then everybody's gonna follow the test scores and, and go for that and pursue that goal. Um, in the management world, um, kind of one of the, the main axioms of management is that you get what you measure. Um, so if you have a set of key performance indicators that you want all of your employees to, to do well at, they're going to focus explicitly on doing just those. Um, because that's what they're getting measured and evaluated against, and so um, that's what they're going to do, which is the natural human thing to do or the natural dolphin thing to do. Um, we want to maximize our utility, and so we're going to figure out the, the rules of the game to make it so that we can do the best and get the most reward. Um, so we want to have good incentives um, or incentives that are structured in a way that make it so people respond to what you actually want. Um, and there are a whole bunch of examples of of where this gets messed up, especially when you already have an intrinsic motivation to do something. If that gets replaced by extrinsic motivation, um, then it turns into kind of a market transaction and it removes kind of the moral imperative to do the good thing that you want somebody to do. Um, a couple sessions ago, we talked about the Israeli daycare example that economics textbooks always talk about because it's a fascinating example. Um, brief review of that. Um, there was a, a daycare 
um, that had lots of parents coming late and they didn't want that anymore, so they imposed a fine um, so that parents would stop coming late. Um, but what ended up happening is more parents started coming late because it turned the, the transaction into um, a financial one. Parents no longer had to think about letting their, their, um, their children's preschool teachers down because they were late or disappointing anybody. They could just say, can I afford the fine today? Sure. And then they could be late. Um, it essentially gave them permission to break social norms because social norms turned into a market transaction. And then the, the intrinsic motivation for not being late disappeared. It was replaced by the extrinsic motivation. Um, this happens in all sorts of fields. Um, in the United States, when you donate blood, you do it for free. Um, you do get like a cookie um, for the Red Cross and you can like join the Red Cross's um, frequent donor program. And if you donate a lot, they start giving you like water bottles and camping chairs and t-shirts and stuff like that. And that's neat, but they're not paying you actual money for it. Um, because they want to maintain the intrinsic motivation for donating blood. Um, other countries where they pay you for blood donations, um, what, what researchers typically find is that the quality of blood that gets donated is actually lower. Um, and more, uh, they're, they're, they have to go through more screening for diseases and um, they have to reject more blood because of uh, contamination with drugs and other things. Um, and it's because as soon as you put a price tag on blood donation, um, it turns it into a market transaction. So it's, if it's not worth your time to go and donate blood, you're not going to do it. And so you have people like the Bill Gateses of the world um, in countries where they pay you for blood, for blood donations, they typically don't go donate blood. While they, in the United States, they do. Um, and so it, it changes, again, the intrinsic motivation for donation to an extrinsic one and then changes the whole calculus for why you should donate blood. Um, in the United States, we do have plasma donation where they donation, um, where they pay you for plasma. But in order to get into the plasma donation system, you have to go through an extensive screening process and they, they check your plasma. They can reject it. And so they're, they're trying to screen out kind of the lower quality blood. Um, but that's because they purposely built that whole industry as an extrinsic thing with like a, with financial transactions. It's not kind of a, a moral duty that you have to donate blood. Um, some other fun examples of this. Um, taxes here, this doesn't mean like paying your taxes. Um, this is, so back when I was as like an undergraduate, I had just gotten married um, and my mother-in-law wanted us, wanted me to help her with her taxes. I was good at like typing numbers into um, TurboTax or whatever. And I could look at numbers on like my financial statements and I barely had financial statements because I was a poor undergrad, but I could like figure out taxes. Um, so my mother-in-law was like, hey, you can do my taxes for me. And I was like, okay. And so I did. Um, and so for years I did her taxes and she would always like pay me in like dinner or a loaf of bread or something like just like to say thank you and that's great um but then one year after um after a decade or so of this um she at the end said here's 20 bucks for your time and that made it feel weird um because it was it, it turned it into a market transaction instead of just like me doing her a favor and getting a cool loaf of bread suddenly I had to think in my head, was this whole experience of doing the taxes worth $20? And it wasn't because her taxes had gotten more complicated and my skills had increased. Um, and so it felt weird. Um, and so suddenly it changed kind of the intrinsic motivation for me wanting to help to an extrinsic thing of should I help because is it worth my time? Um, this also happens with like, if you ask anybody for a favor, if you want to borrow somebody's truck to move or something, you typically repay them in like pizza or donuts or reciprocate with a favor later. Um, if you say, here's five bucks for your time, that feels weird. Um, unless you pay enough to offset the cost of gas and the time of the person and all of that stuff, then it's not going to be an equitable, fair market transaction, even though it wasn't a market transaction. But the introduction of money to it changes the incentives and changes the whole motivation for it. Um, another good example of this is like a Thanksgiving dinner 
Um, if you imagine you spend all day cooking this really fancy dinner and your aunt comes and at the end is like, great, thanks so much for this. Here's five bucks for your trouble. That's, you're going to be like, that, that's weird because it doesn't like $5 is not going to cover all of the time and materials and, and effort that you put into cooking that whole thing. Um, and by her giving you that, it suddenly changes it from um, kind of this nice thing that you did intrinsically into an extrinsic thing where suddenly $5 is not worth the cost of, or, of providing all of, the, all of that food. And it, it kind of leaves you with a weird taste in your mouth. You're like, ew, I, five bucks, that's nothing. Yeah. Um, and so it changes the whole motivation for doing something. It switches it from intrinsic to extrinsic as soon as you introduce money. Um, another good example of this is um, with playgroups. Um, so in all of the places that I've lived as a graduate student, um, and not here so much because we've been in quarantine, so we haven't really met neighbors and stuff, um, but in, in other places I've lived, um, my wife has met up with different people in the neighborhood and they figured out how to establish playgroups and they have this rotating system where they just meet at different people's houses um, and have kids play and it's great because friendships flourish and that's just kind of a normal thing um, that happens. And so in all of these different places, we have good, strong, close-knit groups of friends um, and our kids are the same ages as their kids and we just have this, this informal institution of playgroups. Um, but in a couple of the different places we've lived, um, what has happened um, in two places specifically is somebody has moved in to the neighborhood and instead of incorporating themselves into the playgroup rotation, um, they say, I run a daycare during the day. How about we just all come to my daycare um, and we can meet as a playgroup in my daycare and you have to pay to be part of the daycare. And so what ended up happening is the people who could afford to pay for daycare suddenly could move their social circles into the paid, blocked off, walled version of, of playgroup. Um, but it was like, it suddenly turned into a market transaction. And the people who couldn't afford it, like us, because we were poor grad students, we were locked out of that world um, because we couldn't afford it. And suddenly it became, again, a market thing, a, a market-based relationship and not an informal friendship-based relationship. It changed the intrinsic motiv motivation to an extrinsic motivation and totally shifted the incentives around and, and messed things up. Um, and then it, it does weird things to relationships because suddenly you can't meet with your friends because are you supposed to pay for that or not? And, and that, again, feels weird. Um, you've probably all experienced this with, with friends from high school that get involved in multi-level marketing um, um, companies um, where you get random messages on Facebook from people you haven't talked to in 10 years that say, oh, hey, how are you doing? You should buy this thing from me and get, on, get in on the ground floor and become part of my downline or whatever. And as soon as they start talking about that, it feels weird because it's no longer this, this intrinsic friendship that you're trying to, to have flourish. It turns into a market transaction. Um, and then instead of like your calculation for talking to them is no longer, oh, I want to catch up with them. It's, oh, can I afford to get involved in this multi-level marketing company or like how worth it is it to me to have to maintain this friendship with this market thing? Um, and it feels weird. And the reason it feels weird um, in all of these situations, that weird feeling is that conflict between extrinsic and intrinsic motivation. And as soon as you introduce um, kind of the extrinsic money part to an intrinsic thing, it, it distorts it and messes it up. Um, this also happens in, in real life with nonprofit organizations. It's not just kind of preparing taxes and preparing Thanksgiving meals. Um, one good example of this is the National Endowment for Democracy. Um, they're a, a big semi-governmental foundation here in the United States, and they provide lots of funding for um, NGOs or nonprofits that work abroad, um, specifically to NGOs and nonprofits working abroad to help with democratization efforts, um, to help with election monitoring and candidate training and, and other things that um, helps democracy run smoother in other countries. Um, but what has happened over the past decade or so is that NGOs who are, re who are receiving this money from the National Endowments for Democracy, 
um, in order to get that money, um, they have to fill out a whole bunch of um, monitoring and evaluation forms um, to prove to the NED that they are being successful in their programming. And then the NED will fund them um, if they're successful. And so what ends up happening is that these NGOs that are off um, helping um, authoritarian countries democratize or challenging authoritarian countries, they have stopped doing more challenging programming um, and they've actually tamed down their programming. They don't criticize the governments of the countries that they work in. Um, they don't do kind of riskier programming. They do easy programs. They do tame programs that make it so that they can check the boxes on their monitoring and evaluation sheets so that they can get more money from the NED. Um, and so, again, it shifts from this intrinsic motivation where you're an organization that's helping promote democratization. But as soon as you introduce this market based idea of extrinsic motivation and, and these grants, um, then the calculus changes. And now you just want to maximize the amount of grants you get. And so you choose easier programs um, and tamer programs. And so that can distort what the NGO was originally supposed to do. Um, and that can cause problems. Um, so again, all of these examples here are about this tension between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation and the utility that you get from um, doing something. Um, you either get internal utility and internal happiness, you feel good because you're doing it, you're providing somebody a favor, etc. Um, or you get extrinsic motivation or extrinsic utility where you get happy because you get money for it. But as soon as you introduce money, it changes the calculation from kind of adhering to a social norm to is it worth my time to do this? Um, and then that distorts the whole reason for doing the original good thing, which is an issue. Um, so the main moral of the story here is, is that, that extrinsic rewards can crowd out intrinsic motivations. So what should you do about this? Don't violate important social relationships by reducing things to market transactions. Um, as soon as you do that, it turns it into a a market transaction where you have to think about the value of money and is it worth your time um, for something. Um, if you do that, then like social norms disappear because now it's just like this cold, hard calculus. And so you don't want to do that. Um, so an another way of saying this is pay enough or don't pay at all. Um, so if you're going, if you really want to pay somebody for their Thanksgiving meal that they made you, don't give them five bucks. Give them the appropriate amount that is that like the value of their time and effort to do that. Um, otherwise, it's not worth it and it will feel weird. Um, so moral of the story is that pay enough for things if you want to pay for them or don't pay at all and just have it be a social thing and pay in other intrinsic methods. Um, so that's why we care about incentives here, especially when you get into public policy and public administration. Um, you can create dolphins in society. Um, by um, crowding out intrinsic motivations. Um, for instance, no child left behind. In theory, teachers are teaching their students to learn for the sake of learning. Um, and that's the intrinsic motivation. But as soon as you introduce the extrinsic part, the testing, um, then everybody shifts their intrinsic motivations to that extrinsic test, the external measure of how well they're doing, and then they focus on that. And it, it distorts the whole purpose of, of teaching people. Um, and so that's why we care about incentives.